Since Warhammer 2, the High Elves have been one of the easiest factions in the game, and in Warhammer 3 this is still pretty much the same story. They can still make a mountain of coin with their many friends, and can still mostly do it from the safety of their island donut. If you're looking for a faction to learn the game with, they're a great choice with their mix of simplicity and massive reward for low risk gameplay. First of all, the pros and cons of the campaign gameplay. First of all, the pros, they are one of the most popular factions in the game, so most of the time we'll be leading the Order Tide Alliance and making friends with every other member. They can also make a ton of cash, both in their own buildings and from their many trade partners. And finally, they can use influence to make friends with anyone who doesn't like them and get even more friends in trade. As for the cons, since they are head of the Order Tide, that also means they're the number one target for all evil factions, so expect plenty of incursions along the way. Also, if you don't become powerful early, setting up a massive lines later on can become a bit of a challenge and push you further and further behind. And finally, they don't actually have that many mechanics compared to other factions, so if you're not making full use of influence, you'll be pushed behind with no other mechanics to help you bounce back. And now you will listen to a word from our sponsor. Now, a couple of the more observant of you might have noticed that this year I got my first duck. It's Louie the dog. What the dog doing? Did you know that Louie isn't just a dog? He's in fact a lord. So it's all through this thing called established titles that lets you buy a plot of land in the woodlands of Scotland. You see, thanks to historic Scottish customs, anyone that owns a plot of land in Scotland can then be referred to as a laird, which means lord or lady, in the greatest language on earth, English. You need a wee. They plan a tree of every order and work with global charities, One Tree Planted and Trees for the Future to support global reforestation efforts. So it's a great way to help the environment, and I think we can all agree that saving the environment that's a pretty gamer move right there. Nice every title gives the recipient a one square foot plot of dedicated land, and every single plot is unique. For example, Louis' plot is EC447874. All the plots are on a private estate in Edelston, Scotland, and if you don't think it's real, look, they give you an official certificate and everything, it's got a crest, and it's even framed. That's how real it is. You can even use your new title officially, so you can apply for credit cards with your law title, you can use it on plane tickets, you can use it on your Reddit account, you can even use it on dating profiles. These tiles are great for people that are really hard to buy for, because you get them something like this, which can say, oh look, I have a little plot of land in Scotland, they can then refer to themselves as a lord, and you're doing your part for the environment, it's a win-win for everyone, baby. So if you're interested in becoming a laird or lord or lady, then click the link in the description and the first 200 of you to do so will essentially be right next to Lord Sulu the dog and who doesn't want that? You've even got a massive Black Friday sale on right now and to get a further 10% off you can use my code Colonel D to get the best possible price that you could ever want. So if you'd like to join Sulu the dog as a laird then head on over to establishedtitles.com forward slash Colonel D or click the link in the description or the card to check it out. Massive thank you to Established Titles for sponsoring the video and the content and now onto the video. Let's now go over the different factions, their stats, expansion options and unique mechanics. First of all we have Lawthen, and their faction leader is Tyrion. For their faction effects they gain 10 relations with other High Elves, minus 50% to construction costs for Shrine of Cain buildings, and minus 1 turn to the recruitment time for infantry and cav units. For the Lord effects, he grants minus 50% upkeep for Spearmen, Silvering Guard Rangers, Archers and Silver Helms units, and plus 3 recruit rank for Lawthen Sea Guard units. The faction of course starts in Lawthen, and for their starting units they have 3 Spearmen, 2 Shielded Lawthen Sea Guard, some Shielded Silver Helms, and a Flame Spy Phoenix, as well as a Mage Hero of Heavens. For their climate preferences, Frozen, Temperate Island and Savannah are suitable, Magical Forest, Mountain, Temperate and Jungle are unpleasant, and Wasteland, Ocean, Chaotic Wasteland and Desert are uninhabitable. For their victory conditions, you must destroy the Cult of Pleasure and Nagrond, and occupy loot, raise or sack 30 different settlements. First you want to move to secure the donuts after your start war is out of the way. This can be done with a combination of wars and confederations, so keep making friends and enemies and you'll take it all in no time. Once it's secure, move west to take out Morafi and then travel north until you reach Malekith. By this point you should have all the settlements you need and have that short victory in the bag. Next up we have the Order of the Lawmasters. This is led by Teclis. For their faction effects they gain 15 relations with men, high elves, wood elves, lizardmen and dwarves, minus 50% to the allied recruitment cost, plus 5 recruit rank for Lawmasters of Hoeth, Mages and Archmages, and minus 25% to the recruitment cost for Swordmasters of Hoeth and Phoenix units. And for their Lord effects, they gain plus 30% to the Winds of Magic reserve change when increasing. Their faction starts in the Fortress of Dawn, and for their starting army, they have Swordmasters of Hoeth, 2 Spearmen, Eames of Archers, Tyranoc Chariot, a Frostheart Phoenix, and an Eagle Claw Bolt Thrower. They also start with a Lawmaster of Hoeth hero. For their climate preferences, they have the same as Tyran, but they swap jungle for Frozen. For their victory conditions, you must destroy Sartorial's Watchers, Clan Morbidius, the Oracles of Sinch, and the Bubonic Swarm, as well as the 30 Salmons. Take out the starting war and then head east to take out Clan Morbidius. Once you have a bit of land and cash, you can then take an army or two to the South Chaos Waste to take out the remaining factions. Then all you have to do is expand to gain a few more Salmons and you're sorted. You can do this to the north, the east, or the west, wherever you go, just make sure you take or interact with as many Salmons as possible to get those numbers up. Next up we have Avalon, and they are led by Lariel the Radiant. 
Their faction effects, they gain bonuses when all of Ulfant is held by High Elves and receive penalties when it is not. They gain minus 25% to the influence cost for intrigue at court actions, plus two hero capacity for handmaidens, and they have two unique rights. The invocation of Liliath, which buffs mages, item drop chance and grants an ability, and the invocation of Isha, which buffs armor replenishment, prevents attrition, removes corruption in your lands, and grants regeneration to tree spirit units. As for Lord Effects, Alariel leaves lingering bonuses on allied regions that she visits, and Alariel gets weaker as Chaos gets stronger, and the army gains 15% missile strength for Sisters of Avalon and Handmaidens. The faction starts in Gain Vale. For their starting armor, they have two Dryads, two Spearmen, some Sisters of Avalon, some Light Armor Archers, some Illyrian Reavers, and a unit of Treekin. They also start with a Hand Maiden Hero. For their climate preferences, they have the same as Tyrion, but Magical Forest moves to Suitable, and Wasteland moves to Unpleasant. For the victory conditions, they must destroy the Scourge of Cain, Cult of Excess, and Seducers of Slanesh, so as Occupy, Loot, Raze, or Sack 30 different Salmons. They want to follow the starting wall all the way to the Shrine of Cain, and then move east around the Donut, taking out Nakari and anyone else who stands in the way of Donut Unity. Keep moving around and uniting the entire Donut either directly under your control or from alliances, and you'll have a great stronghold to go and do whatever you want to get the Salmons you need to get that 30. You can head west into Dark Elf lands, north into more Dark Elf lands, east into Bretonian lands, or south into the ocean and eventually Lustria and the deserts. Next up we have Nagarith, and they're led by Lithanar. Their faction gains missions to eliminate characters that are marked with death, and these missions grant various rewards. They gain 10% to the campaign move range, the Invocation of Morai Heg, which spawns a unique hero that cannot fail an assassination action, so he's great for getting rid of those marked for death targets, and minus one turn to the global recruitment duration. All armies in the faction can also use a unique movement stance, which grants a chance to ambush even whilst moving. For their Lord effects, they have minus 50% upkeep for Shadow Walkers and Shadow Warrior units, and plus 25% to the ambush success chance. The faction starts at the Monoliths, and their starting units are two Spearmen, some Shadow Walkers, two Shadow Warriors, some Archers, and a Great Eagle, as well as a Mage of Shadows hero. For their climate preferences, Frozen and Wasteland are suitable, Magical Forest, Mountain, Temperate, Temperate Island, Savannah and Jungle are unpleasant, and Ocean, Chaotic Wasteland and Deserts are uninhabitable. For their victory conditions, they must destroy Nagrond and control Nagarith either directly or through vassals and alliances, as well as the 30 Salmons. You want to follow the starting wall to get a couple of promises under your control, and then head northwest towards Nagrond to take them out before they get too strong. After this, head south to take more lands before making the leap across to Ulthwan to take the Shrine of Cain and the rest of Nagarith. You can then either expand in the West Mountains or on the Donut depending on your preference to get to those 30 settlements. Next faction is Ivress, and they are led by Ultharion the Grim. This faction has access to the Dungeon of Athel Tamara. This can be upgraded to buff the faction in many ways to unlock new units. You can also capture lords post-battle and perform actions on them to boost your faction. Upgrades cost Warden supplies, which are found when completing objectives, executing prisoners, and destroying at Greenskin settlements. Faction can also spread the mists of Ivress. These can eventually cover the entirety of Ulthwan owned by Ivress or allies. The mists buff units with perfect vigor and unbreakable, as well as unlocking summon the sentinels and the oath of replenishment abilities. Mists are upgraded by collecting Ladriel's blessings, which are gained when upgrading Athel Tamara and the Ivress settlements. The faction also has minus 80 relations with greenskins and plus 3 recruit rank for spear, infantry, and ranger units. Eltharon's army gains immunity to Baron Wasteland attrition, 8 leadership and melee defense of spear, infantry and ranger units, and the army causes fear when fighting greenskins. For their starting location, Eltharon starts off the coast of Gruntim and Gol, and in control of Tor of Ress, with a small army there too. Eltharon's starting army has Athel Tamara Faith Bearers, 2 Silver and Guard, 2 Spearmen, 2 Archers, and an Eagle Claw Bolt Thrower. The Tor of Ress army has 2 Spearmen, some Spire Guard of Tor of Ress, 2 Archers, and a unit of Illyrian Reavers. Faction also starts with a Lawmaster of Hoth hero right next to Altharion. For their climate preferences, Frozen, Wasteland, Temperate Island and Savannah are suitable, Magical Forest, Mountain, Temperate and Jungle are unpleasant, and Ocean, Chaotic Wasteland and Deserts are uninhabitable. For their victory conditions, they must upgrade Athel Tamara five times, destroy the Top Knots, Teeth Snatchers, Bloody Hands and the Exiles of Khorne, as well as the 30 Settlements. You'll need to take out that starting wall to get rid of the faction and get a foothold in the Badlands. Pretty much everyone here wants a piece of you, so take on basically everyone you meet. Try to get rid of the greenskins first, as if they get a war on you, it can seriously slow things down and put you in trouble. Do the bare minimum to keep control of your lands on Ulthwan and focus all of your resources on Iltharion. The best route is head north, then east, and then back south to take out greenskins first, and then Scarbrand last. Once they're all taken out, either expand in Ulthwan or more of the Badlands, whichever you prefer, to get those 30 settlements. And our final faction is the Knights of Kaldor, and they're led by Imric. His faction can tame dragons by seeking them out and beating them in battle. You can also spend gold to gain influence and borrow abilities from the dragons for a certain number of turns. The faction also has access to a couple of unique rights. The Invocation of Eldrazor buffs lords, heroes and dragon princes at the cost of relations with high elves. The Greater Invocation of Vol grants a magical item, flame attacks for all units, an army ability, armor buffs to infantry and dragon princes, and an increase to the use limits of dragon's breath abilities. 
The faction also gains minus one turn recruitment duration for dragons and dragon prince units. Imric's army gains plus 15% to the campaign move range, immunity to mountain and desert attrition, and minus 25% upkeep for dragon and dragon prince units. Faction starts in the fortress of Vorag, and their starting army has two spearmen, two archers, a unit of dragon princes, and a sun dragon, as well as a major fire hero. For their climate preferences, wasteland, mountain, temperate island and savanna are suitable, magical forest, temperate, desert and jungle are unpleasant, and frozen, ocean and chaotic wasteland are uninhabitable. For their victory conditions, you must destroy Clan Rictus and the Pox Makes of Nurgle, as well as encounter two legendary dragons. And of course, the Thirsty Settlements. You want to follow that starting wall and continue north to find Tretch and take him out nice and early. Move east and then south towards Cathay before moving south again into the jungles to take out Kugath. Once this is all done, you can expand into more wastelands and mountains, and there is a ton of that in this area, so go basically in any direction you want. The only difference is who you'll be fighting. The dragons will just happen as you continue to play, as they'll appear every few turns. Now comes to the faction mechanics, and this is a pretty short list. You have Influence, which is a currency which can be earned from events, outposts, hero actions, and post-battle. It can then be spent in a number of things, such as other events, and Lords and Heroes with better effects. Inversely, Lords and Heroes that cost no influence often come with negative side effects, so stocking up on this stuff is pretty essential for the army's performance. Influence can also be used for Intrigue at court. This is pretty straightforward. You just manipulate relations between two factions, even making them better or worse. This is useful for getting someone on side, or for causing conflict between two enemy factions to ease the load on yourself. And the final mechanic is rights. The high levels of access to rights, which can be used to grant the faction various effects. They each have their own gold costs, cooldowns, and duration. The Invocation of Isha buffs replenishment and reduces corruption and attrition for all armies. The Invocation of Hearth buffs Winds of Magic, Power Reserve, and Mages as Archmages and Law Masters of Hearth. Invocation of Azurian grants influence, control, and a construction cost reduction. And the Invocation of Vol grants magical item, recruitment cost reduction, recruit rank, armor, and the Vol's hammer army ability. Now comes to the Lord skills. First up, we have Tyrion. We're going to start in the blue tree, go Merchant Lord and Bonded Service for extra trade, cash, and recruitment cost reduction. Then go Drafts Master into Elven Healing and Lightning Strike for the replenishment. And then Renowned and Feared for all the buffs it brings. Upon reaching 10, go into one of the Majesty of Ulthwan and Bloodline of Anarian. Majesty focuses on the campaign and Bloodline focuses on battle. I like Majesty, but if you want a one man army, then go right ahead into Bloodline. After this, the Sopro has speed, defense, resistance, and an XP share, so are all great pickups. You can also pick a dedication skill, and I like to go for Isha, pretty much for the replenishments, but all of them are pretty great. Inspiring Presence for endgame unit buffs is next, and then Sword Player for any spare points to make Tyrion a better battler, and go for damage and speed to make the most of his final form. Next up we have Techless, we want to go straight into his spells to get him actually doing something in battles. He has a weird mix of spells and an entire tree of passives, so grab whatever you like. And then head into his Sublime Focus line for a ton of buffs to magic reserves, Techless himself, and heroes in the army, and then go to the top row for an ability, resistance, and an XP share. Then head into the blue line and the same choice as Tyrion, then inspiring presence for endgame unit buffs, and then no combat buffs here, so that's all folks. Next we have Lyrial Radiant, head straight into her spells and pick up pretty much everything but Tempest since the rest are pretty great. At level 12 go into either Tradition Dictates or Blood and Fire lines. Tradition has campaign buffs and Blood has army buffs, Blood and Fire is my pick but either are pretty good. The top row has Ward Save, Magic buffs, buffs versus Chaos and an XP share, and then into the blue line going the same choice as always. Some skills have been moved around, but you can mostly stick to the same choices. Finally, Inspiring Presence for endgame unit buffs. Next up we have Lifnar, start off going in the blue tree, same choice as always, replacing Merchant Lord with Looter. Once you can, go into the Revenant tree to buff the army in a number of ways, and then the top row has buffs to Speed, Resistance, a Lift, the Campaign, and an XP share. Inspiring Presence for those endgame unit buffs, and finally Seeking Arrows for a bunch of combat buffs, and focus on range since that's where his best work is done. Next up we have Lotharian, head straight into his spells, the Lord does kinda suck, but might as well get a few extra spells to get more value in combat. At rank 12, go into the Storm of Blades for a bunch of army and campaign buffs. The topper has speed, resistance, and an XP share. Blue line next, go in the same choice as always, and then inspiring presence to buff those endgame units. Finally, sword player to buff him in combat, going for tankiness as eyes his whole deal. Next up we have Imric, start off going in root matcher, all the same choice as usual. Once you get to rank 12, go into the Kaldor incumbent line for a ton of buffs to the faction, army, Imric, and more, so all great picks. The topper has speed, resistance, and the XP share, so all good again. Dragonhorn Presence for endgame unit buffs, and then the Sword Player for combat, focusing on damage for that final form. Alistar the White Line is a kind of semi-legendary lord that all the factions can recruit. Sign the root match tree, going all the usual choices. Once you unlock them, grab the clear cutting tree skills that have a ton of buffs to the line units. The top are speed, resistance, and the XP share. Inspiring presence to buff endgame units, maybe focusing on white lines to make the most of his gimmick, and then Axe Lord to improve him in combat and focus on damage since he can do a ton. Next up we have the Arch Mages. You want to head into their spells first, grabbing any you want from the chosen law. At 10, choose a dedication, exactly the same as Tyrion. And the top row has speed, resistance, bound spell, spell buffs, and the XP share. Root Marcher, same choice as always. And then Inspiring Presence for the endgame unit buffs. The Princes, Root Marcher, same choice as always. Choose a dedication at 10. 
So I'll our speed, resistance, and the XP share, inspiring presence for endgame units, and then the sword player for combat buffs, focusing on damage for their endgame. And finally we have the princesses. These are literally the exact same as princes, but we have the seeking arrows treat the end to buff their ranged power instead. Now comes to the heroes. First up we have the handmaidens. On the campaign map they can damage buildings, wound, hinder replenishment, stimulate growth, and replenish troops. These are battle heroes since their campaign uses aren't great. Replenish troops is never a bad choice to keep their armor healthy, then weapon master focusing on speed and survivability to keep them firing. The top row has speed, resistance, campaign buffs and the XP share so are all great choices. Choose one of the three Everqueen trees, all of them are pretty great but Lieutenant will get them more value in combat so that's my choice. Finally stimulate growth for any spare points to grow the local area. Next up we have nobles, on the campaign map these can secure influence, assassinate, assault units, increase trade and replenish troops. These can be used on the campaign map as assassins and influence factories or in battle as assassins. For campaign you go assassinate, secure influence and specialist and then the rest of the blue tree except replenish and you're done. For battle instead grab replenish first and then weapon master for all kinds of combat buffs and focus on damage to make them as deadly as possible. That being said you'll probably grab everything since there's not really anything else here. Choose a knowledge skill once you can, and they're all about as good as each other, so grab whichever you want. The top are our speed, resistance, and the XP share, and finally any spare points can increase trade. Next we have the Law Masters of Hoeth. On the campaign map they can damage walls, wound, hinder replenishment, spread control, and provide training when embedded in an army. Get them straight into your armies for the spell value. Go straight into the spells and grab anything you want from their strange mix. Grab training for free XP, and then go onto the top row for speed, resistance, and an XP share. Finally the sword play line has a bunch of combat buffs and focus on defense and tankiness to keep them alive to cast. Finally, spread control to keep any lands that are in happy. And finally, we have the mages. On the campaign map, these can steal technology, wound, block armies, cleanse corruption, and provide scouting when embedded in an army. Get these guys an army since it's just a waste of their spell potential, if not. Go straight into the spells and pick up everything since there's not really much else to spend points on. The top row has buffs to the magic reserve, resistance, and an XP share. And scouting and cleanse corruption are great for the end for more items and less corruption. Hiles also have access to a number of commandments. Rebuild Lost Splendor increases growth and decreases construction cost, which is great for building up your settlements. Banish Corruption reduces corruption, which is good for removing corruption, obviously. Rally Citizen Militia increases recruit rank and capacity, which is great when you're doing a lot of recruitment. Tribute to the Phoenix King increases income from all trade and local buildings, which is of course great for cash. And Reaver Patrols reduces enemy campaign movement range, hero success chance, and increases your ambush success chance and chance of intercepting armies using underways, beast paths, or world routes. This is useful for defending against invading armies. And finally, we come to the research tree. The tree is separated into two or three parts. The military advancements along the top, and the trade and cultural advancements along the bottom. Each of the military advancements has buffs for increasingly powerful units, so it's useful to dip into to buff units as and when you're using them. Each trade tech needs a resource to be unlocked, so getting them all produced in-house is well worth it, as these techs have a ton of buffs for pretty much everything both campaign and battle. Cultural has a bunch of campaign buffs, so it's worth picking up once you can. Honestly, for the most part, you'll be focusing on military, and then grabbing anything from the bottom row you can once it unlocks, since most of them need a building. And that's everything you need to know to play the High Elves in campaign. We've got the battle guide coming next to run you through the entire roster as well as compositions and more. So subscribe if you want to see that. We are hoping to hit 50k by the end of the year, so I sure would appreciate the assistance. Also, join the Discord to vote on who the next guide should be for. Vote closes in around a week, so make your choice before it's too late. If you enjoyed this video and or found it useful, then consider dropping a like. If you really enjoy the content and want to support it directly, consider becoming a member on YouTube or a patron on the Patreon. Doing so gets you early insights into future content, increased voting power, discounts on merch, as well as shoutouts at the end of videos like Henry took of his spots at the officer's tier. Thank you to all supporters. One last thank you for watching, and for now, I've been Colonel Damders, and I will see you next turn.